I am delighted to introduce uh, our panelists here to discuss the search for new money, following on in the prior conversation and talking about alternatives to tax increases, alternative sustainable sources of revenue for cities. We're joined today by Sam Tyler, known to many of you in the room, president of the Boston Municipal Research Bureau, an independent nonpartisan research organization dedicated to promoting efficient, effective, and responsible government with the city of Boston. Our first panelist is Daphne Kenyon, a fellow at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy uh, and principal at DA Kenyon and Associates. She focuses on tax policy issues, including property taxes and payments in lieu of taxes. Alongside Daphne is Ron Rackow, the Commissioner of Assessing for the City of Boston, who's been in his post for 20 years. Um, and he also serves as the designee of the city's chief financial officer and collector treasurer. And next to Ron, uh, we have Andrew Klein, who's joining us from Baltimore, Maryland. Andrew serves as the budget director for the city of Baltimore and has over two decades of experience in public finance, um, including prior budget and policy positions with the U.S. Department of Transportation, the White House Office of Management and Budget, and the Corporation for National and Community Service. And finally, I'm pleased to welcome Catherine Levine Einstein. Um, she is one of our authors of one of our flagship research projects, newly rededicated the Menino Survey of Mayors. She is an assistant professor of political science here at Boston University who has written and researched extensively on municipal policy. And I'll turn it over to Sam. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Good morning. Uh, I'm pleased to be a part of this uh, city financial leadership uh, conference, uh, partly from my own relationship with Mayor Menino. And, you know, conservative fiscal leadership was uh, high importance, as many here know, in terms of his administration over 20 years. And uh, we did talk about this conference, and sort of the question in his mind was whether, you know, would this be of interest to people? So uh, I know he would be pleased to you know, see the uh, results of the of the of the program as it was put together, as well as you know the the participants and uh, practitioners who were here yesterday and today. Uh, the topic of our panel is the search for new money, uh, which obviously has taken on greater importance as cities are facing diminishing federal and state funding. Um, there, are the increases obviously for. Uh, employee wages, pensions, health insurance on an annual basis, but also the unfunded liability, uh, debt service. Uh, mayors have been working, I think, to convince taxpayers that their dollars are being well spent uh, through performance measures, and that's good, but that hasn't really been enough. So the, the search for new revenues being a, a, a now a necessary priority. Uh, on this on this issue, there are there is not a level playing field. Uh, clearly, uh, there are significant differences in terms of what states allow cities to uh, provide or or have available to them in terms of tax sources. Uh, Boston and Baltimore, I think, are two good examples of of what that difference means. And we'll talk about that. Um, Differences also in terms of the, the ability of the cities to uh, control a majority of, of their revenues, and that is different throughout the country. Uh, and particularly for cities dependent on the property tax, what to do about exempt property and how can they contribute to uh, the city. So on this, uh, for this panel, uh, there's two, two studies that uh, relate, and we've heard one from the uh, uh, the cities and state fiscal structures from the National League of Cities that uh, is recently out that gives an interesting look at uh, cities and, and their the revenue sources available to them. More in terms of Massachusetts, in 2007 there was a, a report, Boston Bound, that looked at Boston and six other uh, cities around the country and made the real distinction in terms of how restricted Boston is compared to the flexibility that other cities around the country have in terms of generating revenue. Um, our panel discussion will begin with a discussion of uh, pilot payments and their role in, in revenues for cities. Uh, Daphne Kenyon will, will really give us an overview of the pilot program around the country. Uh, Ron Rakow, the Commissioner of Assessing, will talk about the Boston example, which is 
noted as or considered as one of the most effective in terms of revenue generation in the country. And then Andrew Klein will begin with uh, a d brief discussion about what Baltimore is doing in terms of pilot program, but then really go beyond in terms of the flexibility that the city has in terms of revenue generation, how that ties into their 10-year plan. And then uh, Kitty Epstein will, will talk about the diminution of federal funds to cities and then uh, taking from a publication of, of the Institute, how mayors are really getting their ideas for policy. And uh, so we'll, we'll start uh, with Daphne. So good morning. It's great to be here. Thank you to Catherine for inviting me. And uh, as Sam said, I'm going to give an overview of pilots. I'm also going to tell you a success story, but not Boston's because Ron is here, and conclude. And I see it's very handy, although it has me as one minute elapsed before I even started. So uh, <laughs> at the very beginning, I want to make sure that you're with me about pilots, because the name pilot can mean lots of things besides those people that fly planes. And I want to make sure that you are completely with me that I'm talking about voluntary payments by tax-exempt nonprofits as a substitute for property taxes. And right there, you can see kind of how radical this is. We're looking for new money. We're not talking about taxes and fees. We're talking about voluntary payments by institutions that have not had the legal requirement to pay taxes since the beginning of our country. Hmm. All right. So these come in different forms. Uh, they result from negotiations between local government officials and individual nonprofits. Sometimes they're long term, sometimes short term, sometimes they're casual one time payments. Sometimes they go into the general fund, sometimes into specific programs. And there's no definitive time series of statistics on these, but press accounts and our research since 2008 indicates growing interest in pilots due to revenue pressures faced by municipalities, growing scrutiny of the nonprofit sector, and an anti-tax climate. So here you can see uh, which states have communities that collect pilots. Since 2000, 218 jurisdictions in 28 states have received pilots, payments in lieu of property taxes. Over 420 nonprofit institutions make these voluntary contributions to cities, towns, counties, and school districts. And this accounts for about $92 million per year. The Northeast is the most important for pilots. The Northeast accounts for 80% of localities that collect pilots, 73% of the institutions that make pilots, and 83% of pilot revenue generated by pilots. Why is it so important? Well, as you all know, the nor Northeast relies very heavily on the property tax. As we found, the Northeast also has a very large nonprofit sector, and there also tends to be kind of copycat behavior. If a town next to you has a pilot program, then you're more likely to have one. And pilots are really what we say an eds and meds phenomenon or educational institutions and hospitals are really important. And actually, within eds and meds, universities and colleges contribute over 2 thirds of local pilot revenues. And this chart is really important because you should know that even among all those localities that have pilots, 
Pilots are a small share of revenue in most places. So the vertical axis here is number of localities, the horizontal axis is percent of revenues, and you see that almost all the localities are clumped up into the category of 0 to 0.25% of revenue, right? And so go to the far right, and you'll see that only either two or nine localities receive as much as 5% of general revenue or 5% of property taxes in the form of pilots. So the top 10 localities receive 74% of total revenue. Boston is the top. Um, you can see New Haven, Providence, also really important. And the top 10 nonprofits contribute 52% of revenues. And you can see that Boston University, where we are now, is number five in the country in making pilot payments. And I should tell you that out on the registration desk, you can get a copy of our original pilots report. But for these statistics, there is a further report published in 2012 with my co-author, Adam Langley, that has all the statistics. And you can download that from our website. So there's some arguments in favor of pilots. The most important are the first two, which I'll focus on. Hey, you can get revenue. You can get significant but limited revenue. I think at one point we figured that uh, pilot revenue in Boston could fund the library system. Yeah. Um, and there's also an argument that nonprofits should pay for public services they consume. So Boston University here probably benefited from snow, some snow plowing this winter. Uh, police, fire, other things, uh, BU may well have benefited. So many people say, well, BU has uh, ability to pay. Why shouldn't they contribute? But there are very important um, arguments against pilots as well. Uh, pilots can lead nonprofits to raise fees or cut services. It is a limited and can be an unreliable revenue source. Uh, pilots are often ad hoc, secretive, and contentious. Uh, and they can be unfair. Remember, these are voluntary payments. So how can you make sure that every university the size of BU pays the same? So we found two main problems with pilots. Uh, attempts to obtain pilots can be highly contentious, so we argue take a collaborative approach. Make sure that pilots serve mutual interests. And really, the president of BU is uh, a great example of that. Um, he has been quoted as saying that his mission in life is to make BU the most successful school possible. And he can only do that in a city that's fiscally healthy. And so you know, he supports pilots. A second uh, problem with pilots is that the voluntary nature can lead to inconsistent treatment of nonprofits. So we say that a systematic approach is good. You have a systematic framework for individual negotiations. And Boston is a great example of that. But I'll leave that to Ron. So here for a few minutes, my four minutes remaining, I'll depart from my slides, because I did want to want to give you a success story. And first, is anyone here from Providence, Rhode Island? OK, so I won't get any feedback, but we'll see. So Providence really followed Boston, um, which I'll get to in a minute. But let me first note why Providence uh, tried to have a pilot's program and what its challenge was. Let me read the top six employers in Providence. Brown University, Rhode Island Hospital, Lifespan, Women's and Infants Hospital, Roger Williams Medical Center, the Miriam Hospital. Sounds like a lot of tax exempts. Hmm. In 2003, the city of Providence reached its first pilot agreement with four colleges. It was a 20-year agreement. And the mayor then argued with quote, with total annual budgets of 750 million, combined endowments of 2 billion, over 25,000 students, the vast majority from outside Providence. These institutions are thriving in our city, yet for all the annual police, fire, public works, and other services these enormous institutions consume, they pay virtually no compensation to the city. OK, so Providence got a 20-year pilot agreement with four colleges at that point. Ha! Huh. In 2009, there was a fiscal meltdown, as you remember. 
So here, six years into the 20-year 20 20 agreement, the city wanted to go back to the nonprofits and get more money from the colleges, and plus expand it to hospitals for the first time. Um, along the way, there were some implicit threats, like there was legislation at the state level to have a tuition tax, a $150 fee per semester per, semester per out-of-state student. Um, the, the nonprofits pushed back. They said, we already have an agreement, plus we're facing fiscal challenges of our own. In 2009, the city started a commission to study tax exempts. That went on for a while. In 2010, the commission decided, uh, no more money. Let, don't go back to the nonprofits. Get more money from the state. Hmm. Well, the big change was in 2011 when the new mayor, Tavares, who you heard from yesterday, came in and found out he had a major, major budget crisis. His quote is, Providence stands on the edge of a financial precipice. If we are unable to achieve the cost savings and revenue goals in this budget that he was proposing, the free fall of our city over the edge will lead us into dark, uncharted territory. All right. And he proposed a, bit, a package of all kinds of things. One of the ones I like, besides cutting um, employee pay generally, he took a 10% uh, pay cut. Um, he proposed closing schools, increasing property taxes, increasing fees. Well, guess what? Pilots were part of that package. And so we have a headline, how one mayor pulled his city back from the brink of bankruptcy. So in 2012, um, Mayor Tavares credited the, the city's exempt institutions with helping, helping to close the deficit and avert bankruptcy. And, and in fiscal 2014, the city got $9 million from these pilots, $1 million more than budgeted. Um, all the city's major nonprofit institutions contributed. Brown, which is the top employer, pledged $31 million over 11 years, and they got money from hospitals as well. So. Uh, a big success story, pilots were a part of the solution. So I have about 30 seconds left, so let me move to the conclusion. Okay, what you should remember, your takeaway, is that pilots are one revenue option for, for municipalities. I argue always, always municipalities should work collaboratively when, with nonprofits when seeking pilots. and. Because of the problems with pilots, probably the most important, you can't raise a lot of revenue from them, state and local governments should consider alternatives to pilots. So I think this is a good segue to my fellow panelists who are gonna talk about other things than pilots. Thanks so much for your attention. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks to Catherine and BU for hosting this great event. Uh, I had a chance to talk to some of my former colleagues, uh, and we were think just thinking about how much Mayor Menino would have loved uh, to participate in this conference. But then I was thinking we'd probably have to add an extra day to get his commentary in. But uh, of course, that would have been worthwhile, too. <laughs> um, I'm going to take a little bit of a deeper dive uh, off of what Daphne has said and into what we've done in Boston with our pilot program. Now, uh, Boston is, is kind of a, a unique in a unique situation. I think we're probably the perfect storm when it comes to tax-exempt property and why it's important to have some kind of compensating revenues coming from our exempt properties. 52% of our land area is tax-exempt. We're the state capital, but we're also a host to 30 colleges and universities and 25 nonprofit hospitals. So, while we have a lot of public exempt land, we also have a very high concentration of private exempt property. I think the other thing that makes Boston unique is that we rely very heavily on, on the property tax, uh, probably one of the heaviest reliances of a major city in the US. So if I were in New York and Chicago and I was getting compensating revenues from sales and incomes from my institutions, maybe uh, my, the, what I'm losing in property taxes isn't so important. But here in Boston, since those revenues accrue to the state, you know, having our property exempt has a much more acute fiscal impact. And so, you know, when you have 
the high concentration of exempt property, heavy reliance on the property tax, if that weren't enough, we've talked a little bit about Proposition 2.5, but our property tax levy is also capped in terms of how much it can grow each year. So even if we wanted to raise some additional revenues from the existing tax base, uh, Proposition 2.5 limits our ability to do so. So those, those three things combined really uh, put a lot of focus on us, on our exempt properties, and where we could get some revenues from them. Uh, when you talk about this issue in Boston, it's really kind of a perfect economics problem in that you, know, you have uh, institutions that are very important to our city. Um, they really uh, contribute a lot to our economy. Um, they're really what makes Boston, Boston. But the problem is that, and it's not really a problem, but it's an issue, is that the benefits of these institutions don't stop at the city's borders. Uh, they accrue you know, to the state, to the region, to the world. And when we presented this slide once for some people from uh, Harvard in the audience, they pointed out that it was preposterous to think that Harvard's benefits would stop at the earth. So we uh, went intergalactic. <laughs> that was for you, Meredith. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> But clearly, you know, the benefits you know, go to a very wide audience. And yet the cost of providing services to the exempt institutions are borne strictly by Boston taxpayers. And the impact on us fiscally falls uh, squarely on Boston. So pilots really are uh, at least one mechanism to try to gain some additional balance between, that, uh, between the benefits of the institutions and the costs that they impose on the city. So as Sam mentioned, we, ha we had a pilot program uh, prior to implementing our new system that really dated back to the 1970s. And by many measures, it was a very successful program. Um, it was a voluntary program. And any time an institution sought to expand its tax base, whether it was from purchasing a property or maybe expanding and building, uh, replacing an old building with a newer, bigger building, um, we would approach the institutions at that point about negotiating a pilot for that additional uh, space that they were either taking off the tax rolls or expanding. And you know, we did gain you know, considerable revenue from it, but it led to a lot of imbalances. There was uh, the level of participation among institutions varied widely. We had some institutions that expanded a lot and, and contributed in the program that were paying quite a bit. Others, not so much. And so that was always uh, led to a great deal of public consternation in terms of the fact that not everybody was paying their fair share. And we really kind of had lack of standards, too. Each pilot uh, agreement was individually uh, negotiated. So each institution kind of had their things in terms of what they wanted and what they wanted to do. And in a voluntary program, it was really, you didn't have much choice to really try to uh, respect and honor those. So, that resulted in uh, pilot payments that are really all over the map in terms of what their basis was. And one of the questions I was asked a lot by our city councilors and, and, and members of the public is, what's the extent of exempt property? How much would they pay if they were taxable? And we really didn't know the answer to that question because since exempt property doesn't pay taxes, we don't spend a heck of a lot of time putting assessments on it. But we had, were asked that question enough where we were creative, we took some of the, uh, property information that the institutions had, put that into our mass appraisal database, and we were actually able to come up with some pretty reliable value estimates. And what we found is that uh, if the hospitals and universities in Boston were fully taxable, they would yield, and this is going back to fiscal year 2009, about $350 million in revenue. So at that time, we had about a $1.6 billion uh, tax base. And to put it in perspective, it was about half of what our commercial tax base paid in taxes. So when you look at all the office towers and stores and hotels in the city of Boston, um, that, that's what it would uh, equate to. So it was, it was quite a large sum. At that time, we were getting about $14 million in pilot payments, so we were about 4.2% of what uh, they would be at full taxes. So uh, in 2012, we rolled out a new program that was a result of the process uh, that Mayor Menino put together in terms of he established a pilot task force that had members of the institutional world, um, hospitals, universities, as well as members of the business community and the public. Uh, we had a two-year process, uh, numerous meetings, public meetings, great dialogue, 
Um, and it led to a set of guidelines for a new pilot program. Let me walk you through those now. First and foremost, uh, it was very important to the institutions that the program remain voluntary. And since we were really approaching this as a partnership with our institutions, we agreed that that was an important component. Um, we also wanted to protect some of the smaller institutions. So a threshold was established that you had to have more than $15 million worth of assessed value before you would be asked to participate in the program. Why 15 million? It just seemed to be about the right number given the population of institutions and, and properties that we had. Here's the key one. Um, the task force agreed that we should uh, ask for a pilot contribution equal to 25% of what an institution would pay if it were taxable. Why 25%? Well, when you look at the city budget and you look at some of the essential services like police protection, fire protection, snow removal, those are the types of services that a lot of people felt institutions should contribute towards. And that consumes about 25% of our budget. That was a standard that we had tried to incorporate into our, our prior pilot agreements in our old program, but people felt that that was really a good reasonable ask for the, the institutions. So we really stuck with that, but tried to formalize it in our new program. Uh, we also wanted to give institutions credit uh, for services that they provide to the community. We need cash, but we also uh, wanted to respect the institutional preferences for services, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Uh, so up to 50% of a pilot payment could be in the form of those community services. And finally, since uh, we knew that we weren't going to get to our, our goals in the program overnight, there was a five-year rollout in the program. So. Uh, it, we basically ramped up the pilot payments over that five-year period of time to give the institution some time to adjust to the new pilot payments. So uh, this chart gives you a little bit of uh, a look in terms of how we've done so far in the program. So we've actually expanded our pilot payments quite a bit since fiscal year 2012. From a base of $15 million in cash payments uh, in 2011, the, the year prior to the agreement, we've grown that to $26 uh, million, so about $11 million worth of growth in cash payments. If you include services in that total, we're actually up to $61 million in pilot contributions. Now, uh, one thing that's interesting is as we've gone through this ramp up period, in the first year uh, of the new program, we had a 90% participation rate, which really, we, sh we were shocked by that. Um, for a voluntary program, that, had, that level of uh, participation was, we just didn't think we'd be anywhere near that. Now, as we've gone through you know, two additional years of ramp up, that particip participation rate has slipped. So now we're at about 75% uh, in fiscal year 14. Uh, we're about ready to close the books in fiscal year 15, and we're still in that mid-70% range in our participation. So it seems like we're, we're stabling, uh, stabilizing around that range. We would, would we like to be at 100%? Absolutely, we would. Uh, but um, we think that we're, this is a program that's evolving. It's still very much a work in progress, and we continue to work with our institutional partners to try to get that participation rate back up to that 90% level. But we're still quite pleased with that 75%. One thing that's interesting, too, is that the participation rate isn't um, uh, the same for all institutions. We're actually doing quite well with our hospitals, and the participation rate there is still in excess of 90%. The, uh, the EDs um, are a little bit lower. We're probably more in this low 70% range there. And then we have some challenges with our, our cultural institutions, and are still working on them. So what have we learned from this process? Uh, quite a bit. Uh, I, I think I'm just going to focus on the, the first one and the last one. Uh, first of all, uh, the institutions have a very strong preference for uh, providing services rather than cash. So we're trying to be respectful of that, but at the same time trying to solve our fiscal issues as well. So we're really trying to work on some programs with the institutions where the services they're providing really are either substitutes for something maybe we're already doing, or it, it may be something that we would like to do where we can leverage some institutional resources and, and provide some services to our residents there. So th that's the area that we've probably been working the hardest on in terms of the next evolution of this program. I think we have some good case studies that at some point I'd love to talk to you about, don't have time today, but um, it seems like we're going in the right direction there, but it's, it's a lot of work. And lastly, um, 
this really needs to be a partnership. Um, you know, I think in some of our pilot, uh, previous pilot iterations, it was a much more confrontational environment between the city and the institutions. We've really tried to approach this program uh, through a spirit of partnership. And I think that's one of the reasons that our participation rate is still high. And as I said, uh, we're, we're still working very closely with, with these folks. And uh, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to continue the program and get some badly needed revenue for the city of Boston. So with that, thank you. Good morning. I'll share with you that I have a heavy heart today, um, and I hope that uh, everyone will keep my city of Baltimore in your thoughts and, and root for us uh, through this difficult time. For those of you who don't know uh, much about Baltimore, uh, we are an independent city of 625,000, and we have a budget of 3.5 billion. Uh, about half of that, 1.7 billion, is, uh, is general fund revenue. And after half a century of population decline, we've, we've stabilized over these past several years. Um, a lot of positive signs, which is uh, what makes the, the unrest that we are, we've been seeing in recent days um, all the more troubling. Um, so I have a lot to talk about. I hope, hope I'll get it all in within the, the time limit. You won't get out the hook on me. Um, but if I don't, we can, we can pick it up in the, in the questions. So I do want to I do want to talk about our voluntary payment agreements with with nonprofits. Um, also, some of the creative revenue solutions that we came up with during the fiscal crisis, uh, and also I, I want to touch on the larger issue of uh, revenue structure. And we've been thinking about it in Baltimore, and I'm sure it's relevant to um, a lot of the cities that that you live in and care about. Our situation vis-a-vis. Uh, uh, the nonprofit community and property taxes is not, not unlike Boston's. Uh, our, our tax base is much smaller, uh, but we uh, rely on the property tax for 67% of our local tax revenue. 33% uh, of our property is tax exempt. Uh, our nonprofit sector is, uh, that's our largest employer. We have uh, major hospitals and universities in the city. And we had the first nonprofit payment agreement uh, from fiscal 02 through fiscal 05. It was uh, with about 16 of our large nonprofit organizations, all of them either hospitals or, or colleges and universities. And that was a total of 20 million over those four fiscal years. That went away um, in 2005 when the city imposed uh, energy and telecommunication taxes that extended to uh, to nonprofit institutions. And of course, that was also at a time when the, you know, the, the housing bubble was going and, and the economy was improving. Um, in 2010, we were uh, suffering the worst effects of the Great Recession and trying to figure out how we're going to, how we're going to balance our budgets. And uh, one thing we did, and I'll talk more about the the, uh, the full plan that we put together uh, in 2010, but one thing we did was we proposed a bed tax. So obviously <laughs> focused on uh, eds and meds, and we proposed you know a dollar a day per bed. <clears throat> this would raise about four million a year, you know similar to the to the um, voluntary payment agreement that we had in place before. The the effect of this was to bring the eds and meds to the table. Uh, we, and we ne negotiated a six-year agreement totaling $20 million, um, but not based on a, a systematic framework. It was you know, just a, a back and forth and uh, wound up at a number, and the, the uh, 16 organizations decided among themselves how, how they would divide that up, and you know, they, have, they have all honored that agreement. But now it's 20 15, uh, fiscal 2016 is the last year of the agreement. So we are currently in negotiations, um, again, on renewing this agreement. 
And uh, our starting point was Boston's model. We wanted to have a systematic framework uh, for this agreement. And <clears throat> since we are in negotiations, I can't share too many details, but we are evolving from the specifics of the Boston model, but still staying within a, a systematic framework. Um, so something you can you know, kind of hang your hat on in terms of uh, the rationale and um, the, the basis for those voluntary payments by the, by the nonprofits. And uh, we actually have an, another meeting tomorrow. These are, these are um, as Ron probably knows, these are difficult meetings. Um, the uh, Eds and Meds have their own fiscal challenges that they are grappling with, and uh, they're not shy about sharing those with us, um, nor are we shy about sharing our fiscal challenges with them, uh, but ultimately, uh, it, it's, it's a very important relationship. We rely on each other, and, and I think we'll come to a, to a good agreement. So let me move from that to the, the larger uh, issues that we were dealing with in, in 2010. Uh, we were looking at a $185 million budget shortfall, and we, our approach was, how do we balance this budget without raising taxes. So we put together a budget that had uh, uh, reforms of our benefit programs, uh, efficiencies, some short-term band-aids like furloughs and, and hiring freeze and, um, and also service cuts. And we put that out to the public and alongside it, we put together a $50 million revenue package and basically, we, we gave the city council and the public a choice. You know, we, can, we can have this scorched earth budget, uh, or we can ease some of the pain through uh, a variety of tax increases, everything but the property tax. Um, th that is verboten. Um, so you know, it was everything from uh, raising our income tax to the, the maximum allowed by the state, uh, hotel tax, energy, telecom, parking. Uh, did I mention hotel? Uh, so we, we were um, uh, everything we could. But then we also came up with a couple of new ideas. Um, one in particular uh, called the beverage container tax. And this it actually wasn't a brand new idea. Um, the city had had uh, a tax in place in the late 80s, as did Baltimore County. Um, we are not part of the county, but we are surrounded by the county. So it's, it was nice to have the city and county both with this beverage container tax so people couldn't be running across the, the border you know, to buy their beverages. Well, the county repealed it, the city repealed it, but it was resurrected in 2010. Um, we put it in place. Uh, and since then, we actually increased it from two cents to five cents to, uh, to support a $1.1 billion bond issue for modernizing our schools, which was a partnership with the school system and the, and the state of Maryland. So I'm, I'm happy to talk about the details of, of that tax and how it works in the, in the Q&A. Um, needless to say, there was plenty of resistance from the, from the beverage lobby, and if you've never dealt with them, uh, they are, they're tough. Um, now fast forward a few years. Um, 2013, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake issued a, the city's first ever 10-year financial plan. And one of, one of her goals is to reduce the property tax rate in the city. Ours is uh, double any other jurisdiction in the state of Maryland. Uh, in Maryland, we, we measure tax capacity and tax effort. The city is at the bottom of the list uh, of the 24 jurisdictions on tax capacity. And we're the runaway leader in tax effort. So it's a competitive disadvantage to us uh, to have these high property tax rates. So that's our focus. And the 10-year plan has 100 plus initiatives, but a few of them have to do with uh, at least modestly diversifying our revenues. And a couple we came up with that might interest you, um, one is a taxi tax, uh, 25 cents per passenger. Um, another is a billboard tax or outdoor advertising tax. Uh, $5 per square foot for static uh, billboards, uh, $15 for the electronic ones that, that can show multiple uh, signs. Now, 
just briefly, taxi tax, the taxi cab industry is, is definitely testing the city's um, ability and willingness to enforce this tax. Um, so we're not seeing a lot of revenue yet. Uh, and the billboard tax, we have three companies that own billboards in the city. One owns 95% of them. Uh, it's a company called Clear Channel Communications. Uh, they have sued the city uh, on First Amendment grounds. So uh, just deposed recently for that case. Um, and you know they, they tried to fight the tax by offering us all kinds of free billboard advertising. And we told them, well, we don't pay for billboard advertising in our general fund budget. So that doesn't do us any good. Um, so we went ahead with the tax, and, and now we will. Uh, we feel confident that we will prevail uh, in this in this lawsuit. Uh, another thing that we did that I think is important for everyone uh, to consider is we stood up a billing integrity unit. So obviously, before you raise taxes, you want to make sure you're collecting uh, what you're owed for your current taxes, and this has been very successful uh, identifying fraud and errors in our homestead tax credit, uh, other, uh, other revenues, you know, where, where's the leakage, where are we losing revenue? Our, our assessments are done by the state, uh, so we are always pointing fingers at them. It's their fault that we're not uh, getting all the revenue we're supposed to get. Uh, but we decided we can't, we can no longer rely on the state to fix these problems. We have, we have to play a role as well. And I said I wanted to touch a little bit on revenue structure. Um, in Baltimore, we have relied <clears throat> for you know, 50 or more years on a structure of mainly property and income tax. And <clears throat> that started when the city was uh, manufacturing heavy. That was our economy. Uh, today, our economy is completely different, but we have the same revenue structure. You know, we, our, our economy is now driven by the Eds and Meds, who are tax exempt. Uh, entertainment, sports, you know, people uh, coming into the city to visit. Uh, we have a lot of um, commuters. We, we export jobs to the region, uh, and yet we're not allowed by the state to have a sales tax. Um, we've talked about the, tax, the issues with tax-exempt properties, um, not being able to, to get revenue from them. And you know, we have no commuter tax. Our income tax in Maryland is, is on um, paid to your jurisdiction of residence, um, has nothing to do with where you work. So that keeps us very reliant on, on the state, not only for direct aid, but, but to run our jail and to run our transit system and uh, our zoo and things like that to, to relieve the pressure on us. Uh, we think we could be more self-sufficient with a modernized revenue structure. Uh, so just that's just something to think about. And I will stop there and be happy to uh, uh, talk about these issues in the Q&A. Thank you. So I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack um, from some of the other presentations that you've seen so far, which have talked about really interesting specific financing problems. And what I'm going to talk about is more generally where cities are getting their policy information um, on a variety of different initiatives. So we can definitely apply it to thinking about where cities are learning about um, the kinds of fiscal policy solutions that um, my fellow panelists are talking about. So first, I'm going to give you a little bit um, of a background in the federal fiscal situation, which I'm sure you are all very familiar with, so we won't dwell on that too long, to give you a sense for why cities are looking for these innovative solutions. Then I'm going to introduce you to the survey of mayors, the novel data set we use to address these questions, and give you some sense of where mayors are getting their information. So first, I just wanted to acknowledge, since this is um, you know, a collaborative project um, from the Initiative on Cities, that this is a co-authored survey um, with David Glick and Catherine Lusk. The research that you're seeing here is all co-authored with David Glick, and none of this would have been possible without the support or assistance of Mayor Menino. So first, let's talk a little bit about the federal fiscal context. So these are just some statistics that show major federal cutbacks um, to cities during the era where we saw most of those cutbacks happening, or the largest cutbacks happening, the Reagan era. And the big takeaway from this table is just that pretty much across the board for all federal urban funding, you see major cutbacks. 
Um, the case of CDBG grants is illustrative for just seeing how those cutbacks have continued over time. Um, as everyone in the room knows, cities are facing a very constrained fiscal climate. So the question is, how do cities respond to this? They're in a context of federal government cutbacks. They're also in a context of devolution, where cities have been given relatively more powers than they were earlier in the century. Um, so we have a context where mayors are looking for innovative policy solutions, but we actually know relatively little about where mayors are getting ideas. Like, where do they hear about these policy initiatives? So the way that the Initiative on Cities wanted to tackle this was by going directly to the source, by asking mayors where they're getting these ideas. Um, so we did a novel survey of mayors um, that actually covered a variety of topics outside of um, just this policy information source. Um, and we recruited mayors from cities of all sizes. So we have respondents from some of the nation's largest cities, as well as sort of mid-sized communities and suburban communities. So we have a really big breadth for thinking about these issues. Um, so we were able to obtain a nationally representative sample of 72 mayors. It was representative on pretty much every demographic or political characteristic that we tested for. And we were, again, able to get 18 cities with um, a population of over 300,000. And getting these large city mayors is especially challenging in a you know, group that we don't know a huge amount about. So first, I just wanted to start with their responses to um, a very general question, which we just asked them, how frequently do you use a series of policy information sources? Um, and unsurprisingly, two of their most frequently used sources are their official and unofficial advisors. So they look to their staff, and they look to unofficial advisors. They also look to other cities and mayors. That's the second most commonly cited source. And that's actually going to be the subject of the remainder of this presentation, is thinking about the cities that have the most influence over policy, where mayors are looking to, um, what would other mayors, um, mayors look to for policy ideas. I also did, though, want to take a a moment to flag, um, since this is probably a bit of a bummer um, for a lot of people in the room, where universities and research centers are. So we do not rank as one of the top information sources for mayors. So hopefully, events like this one can potentially help to address um, that gap. So specifically, when we asked mayors um, to, you know, what other cities they're learning from, we asked them for a list of three cities um, that they look to most often for policy ideas. Um, and here's the list of policy cities from which they get policy ideas. So there's a couple of big takeaways that um, we want you to get from this graph. The first big point is that there are a few cities to which mayors look to most often for policy ideas. So places like New York and Boston are at the top of the list. Austin and Denver are also frequently cited as sources of policy ideas. But there's also a huge breadth in the kinds of cities that mayors look to. So in addition to the cities that we have on this list, there are also a huge number of cities that were cited once or twice by mayors as sources of policy ideas that you wouldn't automatically think of as policy innovators unless you sort of know about um, these cities' particular initiatives. So places like Anchorage, Alaska, Tucson, Arizona, Tulsa, Oklahoma, these are all places that mayors look to for policy ideas. So the big takeaway here is that there are a few more influential cities, but they're also looking far and wide for policy ideas. We also look to see what kind of variation we observe in where mayors look to for policy information. So one way you can cut the data is to look at where Democratic and Republican mayors are looking to for their policy ideas. And there probably aren't a lot of surprises here on the Democratic list that they're looking to places like New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Denver. Um, what we actually thought was really interesting and surprising, though, is looking at the Republican list, we would have expected cities that are sort of famously headed by Republican mayors, places like Indianapolis to feature as the top, but they're actually looking to Austin, uh, Texas, and Portland, Oregon in our data. Um, so that was sort of interesting and surprising, um, and again, something that we thought was worth further exploring, sort of how these mayors are selecting um, their sources of information. Um, so there, another source of variation that we wanted to cut the data by were city size. So we wanted to understand whether big cities or small and small cities were looking at different cities. And again, we see some variation here where Boston appears to feature more prominently on the list um, for small, uh, small city mayors than big city mayors. Um, and places like um, Denver and Philadelphia don't feature on the small city list. 
So using some statistical analysis, we actually more rigorously analyzed um, why mayors look to the cities that they do for policy information. And we found that mayors look to cities generally that are closer to them, that are similar, but on average, slightly bigger and wealthier. So they're likely to look to cities that are generally demographically pretty comparable and politically pretty comparable, but usually a little bit more affluent and a little bit bigger, so aspirational cities. And they look to higher capacity and more successful cities. Um, but we also wanted to highlight they don't use all of these criteria simultaneously. So mayors are making important trade-offs when they're evaluating which cities to look to for policy information. So if they're looking to a higher capacity, more successful city, chances are they're looking at a city that's farther away from them. So it turns out, though, even with those statistical analyses, there was a lot of variation that we couldn't explain in where mayors were looking to for policy um, information. And so we also turned to looking at our qualitative data. Um, one of the really cool opportunities for our, with our survey of mayors is that we didn't just ask them to sort of fill in the bubbles on a survey. In many cases, in fact, in over half of the interviews, we were able to talk to them in person. We were able to get them to flesh out some of their responses. And so we learned that they get a lot of their policy information information from public talks. It turns out that a few mayors had heard a TED talk from another mayor and had gotten their policy information that way. Um, conferences are also important. You know, hopefully events like this one can be useful for the dissemination of important policy information. Grant competitions also mattered. Mayors also, in a few cases, cited cities that had recently won major grant competitions um, for funding of programs like schools. So you can also get on the map that way. And finally, this is obviously not especially surprising, but friendship networks matter. Sort of who you go to dinner with at conferences. I mean, this is true across all professions, obviously not just mayors, but it matters in the context of mayors for thinking about where they're getting their policy information. So just to summarize our results, we find that looking to other cities is an important source of policy information. Some cities are looked to more than others, but there's no dominant or influencer city. You know, we wouldn't want people to take our report and say that New York is the influencer city across the country. There's big variation in where mayors are looking to. There's a lot more to understand um, here. You know, we were able to identify some sources of variation, but there's still a lot more research to be done. Um, but mayors are clearly thinking very carefully about what cities might yield the mo uh, most interesting policy solutions. Um, we remember talking with Mayor Menino actually about some of the responses to these questions, and he discussed that he thought that looking to Oklahoma City for, I think it was education initiatives, was a really useful thing to do, and that there were certain cities that he looked to when he thought of policy initiatives. And so this is something mayors are thinking really carefully about these kinds of policies. Um, finally, we actually asked the mayors, which kinds of policies um, do, you look to, do you look to other cities for information? And it turns out there's huge variation. So this is an important source of information for everything from bicycle paths to education to tax policy. So this is an important phenomenon that we, um, as researchers and policymakers, should better understand. Um, and uh, hopefully we've done a, a useful first stab here. So thank you. All right, now we'll go to uh, questions, and I'll, I'll start with asking a few. And Andrew, I'd like to start with you, because I had talked about the fact that when we're looking at cities and ability to generate new revenues, it's not a level playing field. Um, you know, Boston and all Massachusetts municipalities, for example, have no authority other than the property tax to raise new revenues uh, other than through approval of the legislature. And so, you know, now, uh, you know, a meals tax, the jet fuel excise tax, uh, 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 hotel, motel, room occupancy tax uh, is part of the revenue stream. Uh, but uh, you had mentioned income tax uh, in Baltimore, but also a number of other taxes. So can you talk about, you know, what is the authority that the city has in terms of revenue generation? Uh, and, uh, and then add to that, I guess, the, in the 10-year plan, does, does that look forward to other new revenues? Or in, in preparing that plan, have you identified other cities that are models that you would follow in terms of other revenue sources? 
We do have um, considerable latitude in Baltimore, particularly to impose excise taxes. Um, uh, but I'll start with property tax. We have no limitation on our property tax rate. Um, the state does not impose such a limit. Uh, some counties in Maryland have self-imposed limitations uh, on their property tax rate. Um, uh, we do not. Uh, our income tax is a piggyback on the state income tax and is capped at 3.2 percent. One of the things we did in that 2010 revenue package was we brought our rate up to that cap. Um, the, the state does require um, on property tax that there be a homestead tax credit, um, you know, cap no more than uh, 10 percent. But as, I, as you heard, you know, we've, we have this beverage container tax, um, taxi tax, billboard tax. These are all things that did not require state approval. We also have uh, a hotel tax, telecommunications tax, energy tax. Um, so again, we have, a, we have uh, quite a bit of, of um, flexibility in, in that way. Good. Maybe Ron would like to be the assessor there. <laughs> um, in terms of, of uh, the pilot payments and authority, um, it's all local, um, not needing state approval, but does the state and anywhere that you've looked play a role, this is for everybody here, uh, play a role in recognizing that the exempt institutions are, you know, don't pay taxes and that they're going back to, I guess, Ron's comment about, you know, the benefits extend beyond the city boundaries and is anybody aware of, uh, you know, states where they, they play a role in helping the cities because of exempt property? I know that in New Haven, uh, it's, you know, Connecticut had a program, but I don't think that still existed, but trying to address that kind of an issue. Uh, both Connecticut and Rhode Island have programs where the state sends money to local governments that have extensive tax-exempt property. And just to make it confusing, these are called pilots as well. Um, but states generally, you know, state law is the framework for local government finance. So California, you only have one pilot as I define it, in the entire state, and that's because it's really against state law to have voluntary contributions by nonprofits. In Maine, the governor there has a radical um, budget uh, proposal to take uh, some state, away from, state aid away from municipalities, but then to require them to collect taxes from nonprofits. Last I talked to someone from Maine, it didn't sound like it was going for <laughs> anywhere, but uh, you know, so states can do a lot. Yeah. All right, uh, let's open it up for uh, questions from the audience um, on new revenues. Um, it's directed mainly to Ron, and it's about the services in lieu of the hard cash. Are you, who decides on what services are provided? Is that part of your framework negotiations and, and the level of services? And are they aligned to the city's socioeconomic objectives so that it, you're getting the best return, if you will? And are there collaborative um, partnerships between those voluntary organizations when it comes to providing those services? Uh, that's a great question, and, and actually that's probably uh, the uh, portion of the program that we're evolving the most. So when we first rolled out uh, the pilot program, uh, there was a lot going on, and we really, the institutions were pretty much declaring, you know, the services they were providing, so it, it wasn't collaborative. Um, and as a result, um, there were a lot of great programs, but maybe they wouldn't be the, the top choice of what um, the city would want in terms of the services from the institutions. So what our goal is and what we're working towards is to make the whole service effort much more collaborative in nature. So rather than uh, an institution performing a service and then asking for credit for it, that we collaborate with them ahead of time to say, okay, here are some of the needs that we have. Here are some of the resources that you have. Where can we make things work? Um, and it, it's, it's a very interesting project. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm an assessor, I'm a revenue guy. 
Uh, so it's, it's been an interesting experience for me because we're trying to, to plug different resources together and, and you know, use some of the resources from our budget department. And then both the public schools and the public health commission in Boston um, have a lot of outreach that they do with institutions already. So we're trying to build on that as well. So, I mean, a recent example is Berkeley School of Music. You know, so in, in public schools, when money gets tight, one of the first programs that gets cut is music programs. So um, Berkeley is very interested in what they can do. So you know, they've started down the path of you know, donating some instruments, and, and they are also offering some training to some of the, the Boston public school teachers. But we have a meeting with them coming up in the next few weeks where we're plugging them in with the Boston public schools to see what other opportunities are there. Um, because what, what is really important for the institutions is when a, a, a CFO has to go to the board and says, well, Boston has this pilot ask. Um, it's much more difficult for them to argue for writing a check than it is to perform a service that maybe is already compatible and, and very much in sync with what that institution's uh, mission is. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we respect their, the, the institution's needs in this process, but also make sure that, that we're addressing our fiscal shortcomings as well so that you know, when we get a service from a, a, a nonprofit, it really is replacing something maybe that we were already spending money on, or it's a place where an institution can maybe do something more effectively or efficiently given their resources than the city ever could. So that's really how we're, we're evolving the program in year four and five of this rollout, and we're not done yet, uh, but we're, we're still very much learning in this process and really trying to build an infrastructure where that, that whole service discussion does become a lot more collaborative. You know, we're asking for questions, but also since this is a panel about the search for new revenue, if anybody has uh, thoughts about, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. revenue beyond the pilot um, <laughs> that, or beyond what Baltimore uh, that Andrew's talked about, it uh, would be great to yeah. begin that discussion now. But. However you look for new revenue, the number one source is always going to be taxes. You know, stuff like pilots and so forth, uh, and what Boston is doing is really interesting on pilots, but it's always going to be taxes. And it's really, when we talk about raising taxes, I mean, look at the stagnant wages for 40 years in the United States, declining trust in government for 40 years, and I think, you know, Andrew's city is sort of in the hot box at the moment in terms of uh, city unrest. But how do you, you know, it could be your city tomorrow. It could be Pittsburgh. It could be San Diego. Uh, how, how do you negotiate this issue of declining trust and stagnant wages in the, in the search for new money? For us, that, that's, that's where the 10-year financial plan comes in. Um, the... You know, the couple of taxes I talked about are quite modest. Um, and we're certainly, our goal is to shift the tax burden off of our residents and businesses because it's very heavily focused on, on those under this, you know, what I would call a, an outdated tax structure and move it to whether it's commuters through parking taxes and parking fines, um, taxi, uh, cab, uh, the, obviously the nonprofit discussions that, that we're having. Um, you know, the, the commuter tax is a very sensitive issue. Um, uh, there are no examples of that in Maryland. I don't know that there, that there will be. Uh, but again, looking to how do we leverage some of these economic drivers where we are a regional hub for, you know, employment and entertainment, et, et cetera, uh, and try to capture some of that. Sales tax, uh, that's something the state does not allow us to levy. Um, but it's a, you know, that's a discussion that, that probably needs to, to happen over time. Um, but really, we are looking to uh, tighten our belt. We've, we've extensively reformed our uh, pension and health benefit programs, and we've changed the, the schedules for our police and fire department so we can give them pay raises but also save money uh, because we, we need fewer of them, um, but, but we can still put them where they're needed at the right time. So being creative in that way, we, have, uh, we now have revenue from a casino. Um, you know, there are mixed feelings about that, but uh, that's helping us to lower the property tax. Um, so economic development, of course, is, is always part of the solution if you can, if you can make that work. Um, 
but the, yeah, those are some of the ways that, that we're looking. Um, I guess one more I would mention that, that's in our 10-year plan um, that is a little further out in the 10-year period is um, following the lead of a lot of other cities and a lot of the surrounding counties uh, in shifting from uh, paying for trash collection, sanitation through the property tax to a fee based on consumption of the service, you know, pay as you throw type model. Um, that way our, our sticker price comes down um, on housing and we think that will be a benefit to us. Uh, people will still get a good service and again, they'll pay for what they're using. Actually, I was thinking, Ron, do you want to talk about the residential exemption as a, also as a way to reduce the tax burden on residents? Right, so um, you know, one of the, the, the challenges always with the property tax, especially when you rely on it so much is um, you know, how, how do you insulate residents from an increasing burden, especially the ones that don't maybe have the, as much of an ability to pay? Um, and it's interesting, you know, we've talked about Proposition 2.5, but when Proposition 2.5 passed, I think the city was relying on the property tax for about 60% of its revenues. And then, you know, we had to reduce property taxes for a few years under 2.5, and, and then the, the growth was constrained. And so, at that point, the state kicked in some additional state aid dollars, and, and our reliance on the property tax went all the way down to 50%. But now we've had you know, multiple years of state aid cutbacks or level funding, and uh, you know, the property tax grows and grows and grows each year. And now we actually rely on the property tax for close to 70% of our revenue. So we're actually relying on it more now than when we did before Proposition 2 and a half passed. But, uh, in, in, or, in Boston, um, we've, we've taken uh, a couple of different steps to try to minimize the impact on our residents. One is we have a classification program that, that Sam and I actually debate every year at our city council, but it allows us to have different tax rates for business and residential property. So in Boston, the, the commercial tax rate is just below 3%. Uh, the residential rate is about 1.1%. So um, you know, residents get a, a, a pretty big break there. Um, we also provide a residential exemption, uh, which is basically 30% of the average uh, assessed value for all residential property in Boston uh, gets taken off for anybody who owns and occupies their property. Well, since that 30% includes both $5 million condos and uh, you know, $190,000 bungalows, it actually has a much larger impact uh, on a, a taxpayer who lives in a neighborhood where the housing values aren't as high. Um, so it's, it's a flat uh, reduction. So that also helps add, I think, a little bit to the progressivity, as uh, Andy Ruschowski was talking about yesterday, uh, of our property tax. Uh, but also, it just allows Boston to have a very competitive property tax rate for its residents compared to the surrounding communities. Um, you know, without those two measures, the average tax bill in Boston would be about $7,000 per year um, with those two measures. Um, our average tax bill is right around uh, $3,400 per year. So it's, it's a profound impact and it makes us very competitive. And now that we see you know, so many people from surrounding communities now actually moving back into the city, which is, is a, a great trend to have, um, you know, I'd like to think that's, that's really, you know, people talk about the death of the middle class in Boston and how it's a challenge for us. But uh, some of our tax policies, I think, are some of the best things that we do to try to promote keeping a middle class in the city of Boston. Um, and, and it's a very important part of our, our ability to continue to raise property tax revenues. Can I, can I add something here? Sure. Uh, in, in Maryland, we're not allowed to have differential property tax rates on residential and commercial property, uh, but we found a way around that. Um, we, we decided strategically that it would be helpful to reduce the residential property tax rate to encourage uh, population growth. So it you know, costs us, we're, we're at um, about 225 per um, $100 of assessed value. That's our general tax rate. Uh, we, did, we got approval from the state to offer a, what we call a targeted homeowner's tax credit. So reducing the general rate costs us about three and a half million dollars. You'll, that's probably hilarious to you. Um, and, um, but the, the targeted homeowners tax credit costs about half that much. So now we have an effective property tax rate for homeowners of 213 um, as a result of that. And that's partially funded by the new casino revenue, but also partially absorbed um, you know, through service reductions, efficiencies, and, and reforms. 
Catherine, you want to say something? And uh, this is a good segue into a suggestion I'd like to make, which is just to look hard at all tax expenditures. If you're offering tax relief, try to target it as much as possible so it's not expensive. But I know states right now are scrutinizing their uh, tax incentives for business because times are hard. And like film tra tax credits, which used to be really hot, some states are saying we're not spending the money. So, you know, and as, apart from raising taxes or looking for new revenue sources, you can look at the revenue sources you already have and have, do you have big holes? Are you doing things that are not cost effective? Uh, can you uh, get some of your tax base back? Any more questions from the audience? Hi, good morning. My name is Kimberly Vo, and I'm an MBA student at BU in the public and nonprofit management. And first off, I just want to thank Catherine Graham. Oh, he's not here, but on, and the Initiative Sun Cities for hosting um, this really insightful conference. Um, so my comment is more when thinking about searching for new revenue streams, like Enith, you were talking about. You touched on the concern for you know the little old woman, and you know that's a concern of mine. Um, and especially for working families, I don't want to put the burden on them. And so my fir I have two questions. My first question is, I want to ask, why can't businesses pay their fair share? And what could incentivize them to pay? Um, I see a lot of potential in the pilot program, especially being in Boston, where you know we rely heavily on the property tax and um, you know, the proportion of tax exempt uh, entities. Um, so it makes a lot of sense that it works here, but what about in smaller cities? Um, what can, like if we can possibly link um, the pilot program to more specific project or have it not be so secretive that the public can help um, put pressure on the tax exempt entities? Do you think that would be successful? I can just jump in and say one of the big challenges for cities in thinking um, about taxing business at higher rates is um, a lot of businesses are mobile. You know, some aren't, but there are a huge number that are mobile. And I think a lot of people who work in cities worry about businesses leaving their community. These are important employers, big sources for the tax base. And so um, if you're a city, I think, I mean, I'm sure the other folks on the table can comment on this more, but it's a really big balancing act in thinking about obviously taxing enough so that you can derive fiscal revenues, but not so much so that you become an unattractive place for businesses to locate. So. All right, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but uh, if obviously the panelists will be around if you have questions, um, you know, take the time to ask the questions. I want to thank the members of the panel for this uh, interesting conversation, and uh, we look forward to continuing it. Thank you.